morning. Welcome to River Hills Church this morning. It is good to be gathered together in whatever way we can to worship God and be part of the body of Christ. I am Pastor Allison, the Minister of Outreach and Education, and there are some announcements that I want to lift up, but first make sure that you are reading your Friday e-news. It has a lot more information than I'm going to say today, and if you don't get that, uh, make sure you sign up on our website or contact the office and we'll make sure that that gets into your email inbox every week. A um, couple things that I want to lift up. We have more felting classes that are going to be starting. If you're looking for some more hobbies to do while you're stuck at home, look for that sign up. We also have the blood drive coming up on March 6th, and the registration for that is now open. We are letting church members sign up before the general public, so snag the slot that you want for that. We also are ready to announce our plans for the Sweetheart Dinner. That's our annual youth mission trip fundraiser. That's usually a spaghetti dinner in person in the fellowship hall, but this time it will be delivered to you. So um, check out that sign up link in the announcements. There's all kinds of details in the sign up. That will be on Valentine's Day. So you can have dinner with your sweetheart without having to go out. There's also information about Feed My Starving Children and what we're going to be doing to support them, but you will hear more about that in today's mission moment as well. I also want to lift up that our annual all-church meeting will be Sunday, January 24th at 7 p.m. We normally have a soup supper before that. You are welcome to eat soup on your own before that meeting. Um, it will all be virtual though. The Zoom link is in the announcements. And if you need help um, getting that technology ready, please contact the office with ample time beforehand. It'll be a little tricky to do tech support right on the spot, but if you want to learn to use Zoom so you can participate in that, let us know and we will make sure that you can be set up with that. And also, just as a side note, this worship service is being pre-recorded, so keep your eye on your emails if, um, for updated prayer requests and things like that that might happen before Sunday. So now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we watch this call to worship from Work of the People. May Christ, who shimmers in all creation, surprise you each day with glittering moments. When you can see again how light lives in everything, how it partners with dark soil to bring forth aster and lavender, rosemary and daffodils, a hundred kinds of squash, Let the poor man say, I am rich in him. Let the lost man say, I am found in him. Oh, and let the river flow. Let 
the blind man say I can see again Let the dead man say I am born again Oh, and let the river flow Thank you, praise team. What a powerful uh, witness to us today as we've gone through this week and we ask ourselves the question, what does it mean for us to be the church? What does it mean for us to flow, to let the river flow, to to be out in our community, to be able to make the difference? There have been many challenges that we've faced this week. There have been those in our congregation that that are are trying to figure out what the next step is in in their treatment plans. There are those who have um, undergone uh, unexpected tragedy. And in the midst of all of this, we can spend this time 
in prayer, uh, lifting up our questions and our, and our, and our cries for, for intercession. Um, but I want to challenge us this week to, to use our, our prayer time in a little bit of a different way. We're celebrating baptism today as we lift up and remember the story of Jesus' baptism. And, and that is a new beginning. It's a new start. It, it's, it's, a, it's a way of finding our feet to move forward in our ministry. So I ask you to ask these questions. Lord, what is it? What does it mean for us to be the church today? What does it mean for each of us to be followers of Christ, disciples of the one who taught us? What does it mean for our families to live out the witness of the love that you have given us? What questions do you want to lift up today as we gather in prayer? Let's include those as we join together in prayer, as we lift up the things that are on our hearts, as we ask for God's um, intercession into the, the challenges that we face, but also let's allow ourselves some time to, to stop talking and to listen, to listen to what God has to say to us. Let us take this time now and enter into an attitude of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, let your waters flow. Let us bring ourselves to that place, that place that John set aside for all to come and to repent of our sins. To come to that place to, to know that we are far from perfect, that we have come up short in the glory of God but to know that there is grace in the waters that flow. There is new beginning. There is a new start. There is once and for always and forever the one who gives his life for us so that we might be able to share that good news to all the world in Jesus' name. Lord, help us make our path straight. Help us to find a way. Help us to listen to what your calling is in our life. Help us to listen so that we might hear the words you call us to be in the midst of our creation. And Lord, help us to be good, to be as you intended in this time of new beginning. Lord, we lift all of this up to you today in the name of the one who, when the disciples didn't know how to pray, they came to you. And you gave them these words. May we find the same comfort in these words today that the disciples did as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll now transition into our time of hearing the word of God, first as interpreted for children and then from our scripture readings. So, children, gather around. Hi friends, it's Miss Melissa here. I'm doing some stretching. It's part of my plan for a new me. When January rolls around, it means the start of a new year, which means a chance for a new start. So I always look at my new calendar. Some people feel like the new year is an opportunity to kick off things with a clean slate or start over on things they hope to improve about themselves. They get out a pencil and a piece of paper and they make a list of goals they want to achieve. Sometimes these intentions include things like making healthier food choices or trying a little more exercise. Hopefully people also intend to do more praying or Bible reading. But you know, this doesn't always work. We often make mistakes and sometimes blow it entirely. God made it look so easy when he created the heavens and the earth. When people try to improve themselves or get a new start, they tend to quickly crumble once the going gets a little tough. It's hard for us to really become a new creation. That is, it's difficult for us to do that on our own. But we do have access to someone who can make us new. We can get a fresh new start and a clean slate when we turn our lives over to God. God transforms us from the inside out and God has the power to change us. Today, our Bible readings talk about baptism. Baptism is a very special and amazing blessing, and it's a gift that God has given us. Jesus was baptized when he lived on earth by a man named John. We learned about John the Baptist during Advent. He was the one who wore scratchy clothes made out of camel hair, and he ate locusts and wild honey. The special thing about baptism is that it reminds us our sins are washed away. Baptism uses water, but the water isn't what does the work. The Holy Spirit does that. And when we let God guide us, it changes us. It gives us the power to stop doing things that hurt ourselves or others and helps us to start being more loving. We let go of old bad behavior and become new creations. So even if you don't keep your New Year's goals or you don't know how to start over again, remember that God is always there for us. With God, anything is possible. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us new life. Help us to remember you have all the power. Remind us of the blessings of baptism. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to get a few more stretches in, and then I think I'll take a shower and remember my baptism. Have a good week. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Gagnon, the Director of Youth Ministry, and I'm going to share our scripture readings today. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee 
and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts and our minds to what you would say to us today. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's readings contain two stories of God descending into our world, swooping over the water and declaring God's creation to be good and beloved. In the creation story, God brought order out of chaos. In baptism, our lives are also brought into focus. Through whatever chaos happens around us, we are forgiven and called into clear ministry for God's kingdom. Both stories teach us about who God is and who we are created to be. In both cases, God takes something formless and turns it into something sacred and beautiful. All of that is what I want to focus on this morning. First, these stories teach us who God is. This creation story in Genesis isn't a story about biology or chemistry. It's a story about theology. And this story highlights to me that God is an artist. God takes a formless void and turns it into something beautiful for its own sake. The world isn't likely to be useful to God. What use would God have for it? And yet, like an artist, God wants to create it. Everything is made and named and loved. It makes me think of when I started college and was an art major for a couple of days. The professor in my introductory drawing class would give us an assignment on Thursdays, and then on Tuesdays, we would put our work up on the wall and all critique each other's drawings. The first week, he said, When you put your work up on the wall for everyone to see, don't you feel like you're abandoning your child? And everyone nodded except for me. This was the day I realized that I should not be an art major. His point, though, was that the process of creation involves an emotional investment. You pour yourself into your creation and it reveals something about you. You want others to love it as much as you do. In Genesis, God is like that. The creation story also tells us that God is a scientist. Things aren't flung into space willy-nilly. Creation is intentional and systematic. There's a plan. God spends the first three days creating realms. Day and night, sky and sea, land and plants, The next three days, God creates inhabitants for those realms, stars and planets, birds and sea creatures, land animals and people. Having an overall creative vision is great, but you can't make the sky and the sea and then go directly into making sheep just because it strikes your fancy. The sheep would find themselves in a very uncomfortable situation. There needs to be a system, and there is. God designs a plan, implements the process, and then sits back and takes stock of the work. Every step is declared to be good before the next step is taken. This also teaches us something about who God is. The people who recorded this story had another motivation, too. They not only wanted to teach us about who God is, they also wanted to teach us about who our God is compared to the other gods who were worshipped all around them. In the ancient Near East, it was common to have a creation story involving chaos and deep, formless waters. The gods would violently battle sea monsters and each other and determine who would win. Not our god, though. Our god sees the formless deep water, swoops down over it, and commands it to order itself. The chaos obeys the sound of his voice. God didn't have to defeat the sea monster. God created the sea monster. God acts alone with authority and calm and finishes everything with a day to spare. 
If we keep reading in Genesis, we also see that God is present and involved with humanity, not distant and aloof like the other gods worshipped at the time. God takes something formless, makes it sacred and beautiful, and then sticks around to enjoy its goodness. These are important things to know about our God. The story also tells us about us, about all of creation and our place in it. The end of the story tells us that humanity was created in God's image. That means that we too are filled with creative possibility and the ability to take things, to make things that are good and beautiful. It teaches us that we and everything else are good and intentional and wanted. More than that, each part of creation is seen to be good and valued on its own before it is in any way productive. God likes the empty space and the brand new fish and the idle humans just as they are before they've accomplished anything. And then after days of making things, God rests. Was it because God, who never sleeps and who watches over us day and night, was too tired to keep making things? Was it because God, who thought up all of this and is continually creating, just ran out of ideas? Of course not. It's because resting is critical to the well-being of everything God has created. Usefulness and productivity don't determine worth. But why am I going on and on about the creation story? Today isn't Creation Sunday, it's Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Well, for one thing, the baptism reading we just heard from the Gospel of Mark is about beginnings. Jesus' baptism is just a few verses into the book, and at the very beginning, Mark introduces the whole story by saying it's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's another creation story of sorts, the beginning of God's recreation. Just as God brought life from the original primordial waters, God brings us new life through the baptismal waters. God's spirit swoops down into the formlessness of our lives and brings order and purpose. In this version of creation, the lessons from the first creation continue to apply. Like the creation story, the baptism story teaches us who God is. For one thing, it shows us that God did not leave after creation was sorted out, but is still present and involved with humanity. This is also one of just a few Bible stories that show us the Trinity, clearly. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all make an appearance. God is revealed to be a relationship of love. We see who God as a whole trinity is, and we learn who Jesus has come to be. Instead of angels coming to shepherds or stars leading wise men, like we find in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, Mark tells us who Jesus is when the heavens tear open, the Spirit swoops in, and a voice declares that this is God's Son, the Beloved, in whom God is well pleased. I do have to admit that every time I hear this passage, I hear part of it in Darth Vader's voice. Jesus, I am your father. Which is definitely not the intention. The intention is that in baptism, Jesus' essential identity is revealed. In our own baptisms, we hear the same thing. This is a beloved child of God. In this baptism story from Mark, we also learn again that God can take something formless and turn it into something sacred and beautiful. The Jordan River where Jesus' baptism took place is just water. In fact, I have been there and can tell you it is nasty, dirty water. But in the Bible, that river symbolizes the liberation of God's people who crossed the Jordan to enter the promised land. God's action then and at Jesus' baptism makes a mucky stream into a pilgrimage site. Baptismal water in our font these days usually includes a splash of water from the Jordan River, but it's mostly from the tap. It's regular fluoride-fortified water. Yet the act of baptism with that very ordinary water symbolizes the cleansing of our sins and our incorporation into the household of God. The presence of God means the plain old water becomes something sacred and beautiful, and so do we. 
Recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit, hearing the fluttering of the dove's wings, changes our perspective and shows us how to look at ourselves in a new way. Once again, it's not about being useful. The water itself isn't actually used for washing or drinking. God is well pleased with Jesus in chapter 1 of Mark before he's done anything that Mark found worthy of writing down. We are sacred and beautiful not because of what we've accomplished, but because of our creation and recreation by God. At various times in my career as a pastor, I have been asked why God created the world. As far as I know, the Bible doesn't say, but as usual, people have come up with their own variety of answers. James Weldon Johnson, in his poem on creation, wrote that God stepped out onto space and said, I am lonely, I will make me a world. In college, I had a professor who said we weren't meant to know why God did it. He said we know this because the first letter in the Hebrew Bible is this one. You read Hebrew that way. And he said the shape of the letter tells us that we're only meant to know things that happened this way in the story. Anything that happened above, below, or before is just none of our business. There's also really the larger question of why any artist creates anything. In 1974, when Philippe Petit strung a tightrope wire between the two World Trade Center towers and walked around 1,300 feet in the air, people asked him afterwards, why did you do it? And he said, there is no why. Isn't the joy, the beauty, the sheer magnificence enough of a reason? Perhaps that's God's reason for creation too, both for the world as a whole and for each of us. Perhaps the joy, the beauty, the sheer magnificence are enough. God's spirit present in the world and in our lives takes the simple formless thing that we might otherwise be and turns us into something sacred and beautiful. This new year is so far still formless and unordered, but God is as present as ever, bringing order from chaos. And we are made in God's image, filled with creative possibility and the ability to make things that are good and beautiful. We ourselves are good and intentional and wanted, not because of all the things we'll get done in 2021, but because God's Spirit has swooped into our lives and into our world and transformed the ordinary into the sacred. When things around you seem formless and chaotic, listen for that flutter of dove's wings. God is hovering nearby. Let's pray. Creating God, help us to see the sacred in your creation and in each other. Remind us that the ordinary can be transformed by your presence and that we are enough, just as we are. Amen. We'll now transition into a time of sharing where we will hear opportunities where we can serve our community and a shout out to those who have contributed to this community of God. Take this time to think what we can do to transform the world around us. I'm Carol Wild with the Mission Committee. This month's mission moment is for Feed My Starving Children, which creates food packs for hungry people around the world. The COVID crisis has only increased the critical hunger already facing so many people worldwide. The ministry, which was based on volunteer in-person meal packaging has been greatly limited during the past 10 months. They have shifted their packaging to manufacturing plants so that hungry people can still be fed. But this has caused a large increase in their costs. In the past, we have coordinated a church-wide packing day, but we are postponing that for now. Instead, we will be inviting you to give to help cover FMSC's additional packing costs. You can either give through the FMSC website or send your donation to the church with FMSC in the memo. If you're feeling called to pack in person, 
you can sign up as an individual or household through their website. Good morning. Today's Sunday shout out came from our church member, Siri, who wanted to give a shout out to those who helped decorate and undecorate the sanctuary for Christmas. Um, that was done by a wonderful group of volunteers and staff members. And we are just so thankful that we could have such a beautiful and festive sanctuary to celebrate Christmas. If you have a shout out that you would like to share, please send me an email at egannion at riverhillsumc.org. Thank you. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down eating your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you whiter than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh. Down to the river, down to the river to pray. Hey, hey, let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Let's go down, down, down to the river. I've seen it move in my own life. Took me from dusty roads into paradise. All of my dust, all of my shame, drowned in the streams that have made me born again. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh. today knowing that you were created sacred and beautiful. And when things get chaotic, listen for the flutter of the Holy Spirit's wings. Amen. 